So first things first, what do I mean when I use the word gender? Well, for the purpose of this talk, when I use the word gender, I'm just talking about sex typed behavior. So this is a behavior that would be, be um, stably associated with or more often exhibited by one sex or the other. Or you might think of this as a gender typical behavior. An example of such a behavior could be something like offspring transport. So this is something that either males or females could do, or both could do equally, and if they did, then it wouldn't be a sex type behavior. Now it just so happens that in jawfish, which are up here, black-legged poison dart frogs, giant water bugs, and owl monkeys, this is a job that is almost exclusively the job of the, of the male. And in cichlid fish, and strawberry poison dart frogs, in wolf spiders, and in ringtail lemurs, this is a job that is done exclusively, exclusively by the female. So in, this spe in these species, this is a male-type behavior, and in these species, it's a female-type behavior. So those are the kinds of things that I'm going to be talking about today. One of the things that I'm not going to be talking about today is gender identity. Now, I recognize that this is a really big, important part of human gender. But it's not something that we can easily ask non-humans about, and nobody has thought of a way to do it so far. So since I'm going to be talking about what I think the primate data, the non-human primate data, who I'll mostly just refer to as primates, have to say about the evolution of gender in humans, we're not going to talk about this component of gender identity in my talk. So certainly not every behavior that humans exhibit is sex-typed, but there are a few that we pretty reliably exhibit. So, Across many societies, it's com more common for girls to play with dolls than it is for boys to play with dolls. Across societies, if little kids get in fist fights, those little kids are more likely to be boys than they are to be girls. In our society, the kids who take dance lessons are more likely to be girls than they are to be boys. And the kids who take football lessons are more likely to be boys. Do they call those lessons? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't take those lessons are more likely to be boys than they are to be girls. And these gender differences persist through adulthood, such as when adults go to Levi's Stadium to engage in athletic activity, women do synchronized dancing, and men practice football. So as a gender nonconforming person, I noticed from an early age that these gender norms are reproduced in society with reasonably high levels of fidelity. And I always wondered, what is up with that? A more academic way of answer, asking that question is, what causes the, the development of gender typical behavior? So now is the time to get your phone back out, go to meet.ps forward slash science, and tell me what you think. And if this doesn't work, we'll just raise hands. So I imagine that this is a question that almost everybody in this audience has engaged with at some point in life. And the possible answers range from it being A, the expression of innate gendered tendencies on one hand, to E, being overtly socialized by people who are external to the individual. Or maybe it's C, equal parts innate and socialized. Or maybe you think it's B, mostly innate but partly socialized. Or maybe you think it's D, mostly socialized but partly innate. Now I have to wait for you to answer. All right, so what did you guys decide? OK, so in this crowd, people lean towards gender being mostly socialized, but partly innate. I'm not terribly surprised that that is the way that this audience leans with respect to that question, because I'm guessing many people in this audience have felt constrained by gender norms before. Um, I certainly have. Almost nobody thinks that it is entirely socialized, and nobody thinks that it is entirely innate. These hypotheses are all reasonable hypotheses. So let's talk briefly about the human data, because not surprisingly, the mechanisms of human gender development have been subject to a lot of, 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 of a lot of research. So people who are interested in understanding the sort of innate tendencies uh, that generate gendered behavior, um, they focus on what some people would call biological factors, which usually are hormones uh, expressed in the prenatal, perinatal, and postnatal periods. And people are interested in figuring out how hormones influence the development of gendered behavior. I don't really like to call those biological factors because while we are biological beings, we are also social animals and our social behavior is every bit as much a part of our biology as our bodies are. So I like to call these somatic factors, which means that they are derived from uh, the body or the soma. Certainly, there's also been a lot of research on the importance of socialization in humans from both parents and peers in driving gender development. And these extrinsic forces on the individual are what we usually are talking about when we talk about gender socialization. That's what we mean when we say that. 
But I want to point out that socialization can also be intrinsically motivated. So socialization is just the process of relying on social interaction or information to acquire your behaviors. So even without other people telling you to behave in gendered ways, you can actually acquire gendered behavior through socialization. For example, if you were a boy and you were more likely to hang out with boys, or if you were a girl and you were more likely to hang out with girls. And that mechanism is a necessary precursor uh, for uh, modeling your behavior after same-sex models. I have good news for you, which is that all of you are right. There are data in support of all of these mechanisms being important for the development of human sex type behavior. And so, to some degree, you can pick your poison here because if you really think that socialization is, is the driving factor in human gender development, then you can kind of dismiss some of the hormonal data because most of them are derived from clinical populations. And so you can say, well, those are from clinical populations. I don't really think that they apply to the average Jane or Joe Schmo. But if you really think that, uh, innate or somatic factors are really important in driving gender development, then you can kind of dismiss the socialization data as overblown because all of them are correlational and uh, you know, maybe some of them are responses to ch children's gendered behavior and not causes of ch children's gendered behavior. And people go around and around on this question just like that. But it turns out that many of the non-human primates also live in really complex social groups just like we do, and they also develop sex type behavior just like we do of one kind or another. And since they are our distant family members, we can learn some things about ourselves by learning about them. Just like you might be able to learn something about yourself from understanding something about your first cousin and your second cousin and your third cousin and so on. So for example, let's just say that we think that prenatal testosterone determines boys' increased in tendency to uh, engage in rough and tumble play. But we're not totally sure and we definitely, definitely can't do experiments on people to figure that out. Well, if we were to look at other apes and old world monkeys and new world monkeys, and we found that fetal testosterone determines rough and tumble play in males of those species, then that would support our hypothesis about humans because it works that way in all of our living relatives. So this is one way that we can attempt to clarify uh, our understanding of the mechanisms of human gender development by looking at our primate relatives. The other really important thing that we can learn from primates is about the evolutionary history of human gender behaviors and developmental processes. So if we return to our example that I just talked about, where new world monkeys, old world monkeys, and apes all share this hypothetical process of behavioral development, then the most reasonable inference is that that behavioral development worked the same way in their last common ancestor back here. And in that case, it would mean that that developmental process is, is evolutionarily ancient. In this example, it would be 47 million years ago ancient. So reconstructing the evolutionary history of behaviors and developmental processes gives us an idea about their temporal depth. And it's reasonable to think, although we do not know for sure, it is reasonable to think that behaviors that have a very deep evolutionary history might be harder to change than behaviors that have arisen relatively recently in our evolutionary history. One point I want to make here is that this process of reconstructing the evolution of things is something that cannot be done by one person. It requires tons of basic research on all of these species. So without that basic research, we really have no hope of reconstructing the evolutionary history of humans. And that's one thing that I want to highlight about one of the values of basic research that maybe you don't know why we want to know about lemurs, but you can't really reconstruct the evolutionary history of primates without lemurs, and you can't reconstruct the evolutionary history of humans without primates. So there is some value, even maybe to you, to uh, understanding lemur behavior. So using that logic, we can then ask all of these questions about primate sex type development. And that's what I'll spend the rest of my time talking about because that's what I know the most about. So we'll start with somatic factors. And here I'm gonna collapse the prenatal and the perinatal and the postnatal periods because the bottom line is the same no matter, where you look, no matter how you look at it. So the role of hormones in the development and maintenance of sex type behavior has actually been investigated um, pretty thoroughly and mainly through experiments, um, mostly on macaques, that involved either androgen supplementation or androgen blocking. And just to orient you, macaques are old world monkeys, with whom we shared a common ancestor about 32 million years ago. So there have been lots and lots of behaviors investigated in this body of work, and I'm not going to drag you through all of them, but I'm going to walk you through two, the experimental outcomes for two behaviors, because they illustrate the point I want to make. 
Maternal mounting is something that juvenile males commonly do and juvenile females almost never do. This is an important part of uh, juvenile males learning uh, species appropriate sexual behavior, actually. They also mount juvenile females and subadult females, and they mount each other, they do a lot of mounting. But they do mount their moms during, during their subadult period. Males also engage in more rough and tumble play than females typically do um, in many species, including macaques. These are langurs, but I just like this picture better. And we know that if you neuter infant male macaques right after they're born, then their uh, maternal mounting behavior and their rough and tumble play behavior develops completely normally without any other, so that means that it's not reliant on the postnatal testosterone surge, it's not relating, reliant on any other postnatal hormones, which they don't really have any after the postnatal testosterone surge anyway. So all of this suggests that prenatal testosterone is the thing that's driving male typical juvenile maternal mounting and rough play behavior. This has been experimentally investigated by then exposing female fetuses to higher than normal levels of testosterone while they are in utero. And you can give them either low doses of testosterone or high doses of testosterone, either early or late in gestation. Then you see what that does to the development of later behavior during the juvenile period when there's animals have grown up. So for these two behaviors, what happens is this. If you give female fetuses low doses of testosterone early in gestation, nothing happens. They don't mount their moms, and they don't show any increases in rough and tumble play. So these behaviors are unaffected by low doses of testosterone early in gestation. But if you give them high doses of testosterone early in gestation, then they mount their males as juveniles just as much as unmanipulated males do. So that behavior is completely masculinized by high doses of testosterone early in gestation. But they still don't have elevated rates of rough and tumble play. So that behavior is still unaffected. If you give female fetuses low doses of testosterone late in gestation, what happens is that their mounting behavior is completely unaffected. They're indistinguishable from unmanipulated females. But their rough and tumble play is partly masculinized. So they play at, uh, they, they engage in rough and tumble play at levels intermediate between unmanipulated females and unmanipulated males. If you bump that up and increase that to high doses of testosterone late in gestation, what happens is nothing to their mounting behavior, completely unaffected. But their rough and tumble play behavior then is completely masculinized and they play rough and tumble play at, at rates uh, undistingu indistinguishable from unmanipulated males. So maternal mounting behavior is sensitive only to high doses of testosterone and only early in gestation. Rough play is sensitive to any level of testosterone, but only late in gestation. So this pattern of results shows two things. It shows that individual behaviors have their own sensitive periods and their own dose sensitivities that are different from those of other behaviors. So the answer to whether hormones are important in driving the development of sex type behavior in primates is certainly yes, but it's complicated. It's not a straightforward process by which you add androgens and you get butch monkeys, or you add estrogens and you get femme monkeys. It's not, it's not simple like that. It's not simple at all, actually. It is a really complex developmental system in which different behaviors are sensitive to different dosages of different hormones at different times in development. And what I think that means is that you have a system with numerous opportunities for the production of diverse outcomes. And in fact, I think that the complexity of the developmental system all but guarantees diverse outcomes, and really, diversity should be an expectation of our complex development and not a surprise. All right, so what about socialization? This is really my favorite stuff, because of course we expect somatic factors to be important in the development of behavior for monkeys, they're animals. But as social animals, socialization might be important for them too. So the experimental for data from macaques makes it really clear that social experience is important for the de development of later behavior because people have manipulated the early rearing environments of macaques fairly extremely and weird things happen. But what I think is the most interesting socialization data from captive studies comes from some sort of accidental experiments that have been done, uh, including on IIs and chimps. So we know that, we've known for a long time that uh, the development of male mating competence for macaques depends on species appropriate social experience. But it turns out that this is also true for chimpanzees and it's also true for the IIs, which are a solitarily foraging lemur, which hardly spend any time with other animals in the wild. So this is a species where we'd expect most of their behaviors not really to rely on socialization because they don't really see other animals very much. But still, it turns out from a couple of uh, situations in which animals had to be removed from their moms for some reason, uh, 
Um, and, in, and even in situations where those caretakers tried really hard to replicate as closely as possible species appropriate rearing, these males still did not develop uh, species appropriate mating competence. Basically what happens is that when they grow up in their adolescence, they're really interested in mating when they're presented with a fertile female, but they don't know where things go. So you can teach them where things go with peanuts or whatever treat that they like, and that's what people have done. But what I think is really compelling about this example in particular is that if there is one and only one behavior that you expect natural selection to program into animals, and for it not to be able to be messed up by social experience, it would be the mechanics of mating. But apparently this is not so. And apparently it's not so even for the lemurs. So the development of male mating competence depends on species appropriate social experience in at least one lemur, as well as in all world monkeys and apes. And what I think this suggests is that social learning is probably an important determinant of behavioral development generally across all primates and probably for most behaviors. And that this general phenomenon of social learning is very evolutionarily ancient. All right, so. Captive studies can tell us with absolute certainty that somatic and social factors are both important for normal behavioral development, but what they can't do is tell us how those things are actually working in normal behavioral development, because the whole point of captive experimentation is to poke the system and see what changes, which is great, but it automatically means that you're not studying the system as it naturally occurs. So this is where I think the strength of observational research comes in. And as non-experimentalists, we can't say anything with as much certainty as experimentalists can, but we know that what we find about our animals is relevant to the natural functioning of their populations in complex ecological and social environments where they evolved. So we can explore the hormonal correlates of behavior in wild populations, which we do, mostly through the use of uh, biological materials that our animals leave behind, such as poop. P2, but mostly poop. We collect this poop, we process the poop, we analyze the poop, various concentrations of hormones in the lab, lots and lots of poop. And as an example of how those data look, I'll share with you some of my work with my colleague Tigo Mera um, on ringtail lemurs in southwest Madagascar for my dissertation when I was uh, funded by the Leakey Foundation. So first, though, before we start with that, we need a bit of background on ringtail lemurs. In this species, females dominate males in all contexts, and they are more aggressive than males. So, there are no ringtail lemur kings. There are only ringtail lemur queens. <laughs> Not in any male ringtail lemur's wildest imagination would there be a ringtail king. But this ascension to power over males doesn't develop until about the time that we think these lemurs are undergoing puberty. And we know that in adulthood, uh, seasonal increases in female aggression are correlated with uh, seasonal increases in various hormones. So that suggests to us that the development of female aggression in general might be mediated in some way by hormones. So maybe the development of the entire system at around puberty is also activated by the appearance of gonadal hormones, which happens to you during puberty. So to test that hypothesis, we measured levels of testosterone over the developmental period into adulthood, and this is what we found. So here we've got males in blue triangles and females in orange circles. So during the first year of life, when these lemurs are infants and then they get weaned and then turn into young juveniles, males have higher levels of testosterone than females do, which is really just capturing the neonatal testosterone sur surge, which is something that happens in all mammals that we know about so far. After that, both sexes have very low levels of testosterone for the rest of the juvenile period, which is also exactly typical of mammals. And then during the year when females have their first mating season, both male and female testosterone levels rise after which female testosterone stays pretty constant for the rest of their lives and males eventually achieve higher levels of testosterone than females have, which is, again is typical for mammals. But this rise in testosterone for both sexes between years two and three is a good indication of puberty. And interestingly, it coincides with an increase in female aggression directed at males, which is what we see when females are dominant to them, and an increase in submission from males at that age, which is also what we see once females achieve dominance over males. So it looks like to us, the onset of puberty is activating the development of this system of female dominance over and aggression towards males in this species. So in the wild, just as we'd expect based on captive work, 
Hormones are important shapers of behavior, and we have work on many other species of non human primates about many different things that confirm basically what we'd expect from what we know about other species and what we know about primates in captivity, such as increases in testosterone are also correlated with increases aggression in aggression in males. They are correlated with their tendency to migrate out of the group that they were born in, and so on and so forth. And these kinds of work will continue to clarify how the primate body responds to social and ecological experiences and potentially how it motivates uh, behavior. But what about socialization in the wild? So this is actually something that has been studied a lot. Extrinsic socialization by mothers has been studied a lot in the wild because it was always easy for us to look at it. We didn't have to wait for somebody to figure out how to grind up poop to get hormones out of it. We could always just watch this. So most of this has been studied with mothers because mothers are most infant primates' primary social partner at the beginning of life. Um, and it's been studied fairly extensively in free-ranging primate populations. And there are some ways in which mothers of some species treat their kids differently by sex. And I'll tell you what they are. Macaque mothers, for reasons we do not know, uh, inspect their son's genitals more than they expect, inspect their daughter's genitals. Um, they maintain contact with their, with their sons less than they make, maintain contact with their daughters. Both macaque and chimpanzee mothers will socialize with partners that are probably beneficial to their sons, but that take them out of their own comfort zone of their own normal social grouping. And blue monkey mothers uh, will groom their sons more than they groom their daughters. But this has been investigated in many, many, many studies on many, many, many species. And most of the time, we find no differences at all in how moms treat their kids by sex. And when I, mean, when I say no differences, I really mean it. So here, I also looked at this in lemurs. And here are some of my data from ringtail lemurs showing how much time sons and daughters receive grooming from their mothers. From the age of birth to the age of about two years old, which is when, about when they stop being juveniles. And you can see there's no sex difference at any age. Moms groom their sons and their daughters identically across the age range. They just groom them a lot when they're brand new babies. So this pattern of no difference of how moms treat their kids by sex is actually the most, m much more common than finding a sex difference. So, I actually think that there's not really any good evidence that overt socializ socialization by moms is an important driver of behavioral development. Uh, because as far as we can tell, in most species, most of the time, mothers don't treat their kids differently by sex. Most species, most of the time, fathers are not involved in uh, infant caretaking. And when moms do treat infants differently by sex, it's really subtle. It's not something you notice when you're out in the field. It's something that you can get out of your data after you add up all the numbers. So it's really subtle, and it looks nothing like what we see in humans, where you have uh, parental encouragement of gender-typical behavior and parental punishment of gender atypical behavior. We don't see that in non-human primates. I also don't think there's any good evidence that peers constrain sex type behavior in non-human primates. Now, non-human primates don't corral their juveniles in large groups and make them socialize with only each other all day long. This is something that really only we do. So that could play, that could play a role here in what, what's going on with humans. Non-human primates don't do this. Non-human primate juveniles are busy. They're busy finding food. They're busy keeping up with their groups. And lots of non-human primate juveniles actually don't live in social groups where there are tons and tons and tons of other juveniles around. Some species do, but a lot of species don't. Um, Nobody has ever seen anything that looks like uh, punishment for gender atypical behavior in non-human primates. So as far as we know, this is something that only humans do. So right now, I don't actually think there's any compelling data to suggest that extrinsic sources of socialization are important for primate development. But what about intrinsically motivated socialization? So one way that individuals can experience the world in sex-typed ways is by seeking out different sets of social interactions themselves. For example, here are the rates at which my male and female ringtail lemurs approached adult males from birth, again, through the age of two years of age. And you can see that at all ages, infant and juvenile males are approaching adult males at higher rates than their, peer, their female peers. And this results in a situation in which infant and juvenile males at all ages, except when they're really, really tiny and they're clinging to mom all the time, are actually spending more time in close approximation with adult males. So they're spending more time with males as their nearest neighbor. 
So this sets up a situation where infant and juvenile males are gonna see male behavior more often than infant and juvenile females are because they're actually sitting right by them and juvenile females are not. We see similar phenomena in lots and lots of primate species. We see this in chimpanzees, we see it in baboons, we see it in blue monkeys, we see it in macaques, we see it in spider monkeys and howling monkeys, and we see it in lemurs, where juveniles themselves seek out and spend more time around different sets of individuals in their, uh, in their social groups. So this is a common phenomenon among non-human primates. And if you think about it, it's a necessary precursor to social learning from social partners, those social partners through behavioral modeling. There's been very little work on social learning of particular sex type behaviors in non-human primates, but I think what has been done is really compelling. So some of the earliest work on this was, been, was done by Elizabeth Lonsdorf on uh, the topic of chimpanzee termite fishing uh, when she was working in Gombe, Tanzania, in Tanzania, um, supported by the Leakey Foundation. So this is a termite mound. Here is a mom and her juvenile chimp on the termite mound, and that's Elizabeth Lonsdorf in the background filming. Now termite fishing is a really complicated behavior and it starts out with making a tool out of a thin stick or a stiff blade of grass and then you have to pick open a hole in a termite mound and then you have to carefully insert the tool into the termite mound and then you have to wait for the termite soldiers to bite the stick or whatever it is that is intruding their, their turf and then you have to take it out carefully without knocking all the termite soldiers out and then you can eat, it, eat all the termite so soldiers which are big and juicy. So this takes this takes cognitive skill, it takes patience, which juveniles don't have that much of, it takes a steady hand, and it takes young chimpanzees about five years to learn this behavior with any reasonable proficiency. This is behavior that adult females spend much more time doing than adult males, and they are also a lot better at it. And it turns out that infant females learn this behavior faster than infant males do. Also, infant female infant females learn their mother's tool preferences. So some moms like long sticks and some long, uh, moms like short sticks. And if my mom likes to turn my fish with a long stick, I will learn to fish with a long stick also. Males do not acquire their mother's tool preferences. Females do, males don't. So how does this happen? It happens because females pay closer attention. At young ages, this is watching on the mounds, watching mom feeding on the mound. Again, females are orange circles and males are blue triangles. At young ages, females spend much more time carefully watching their mom's termite fish. And then they do what their moms do. Males don't really watch very carefully. They do somersaults, they throw things, and then they don't pick up their mom's skills. And eventually they don't really become very good termite fishers at the end of it as well. But females do, they watch what their moms do and they do what their moms do. We see a similar phenomenon in male tufted uh, capuchins, which are New World monkeys, just to orient you, because we must have been talking about apes and lemurs. Male capuchins are bigger and stronger than females, and they spend more time doing what we call extractive foraging, which means they tear stuff apart to find food that they can't see without tearing stuff apart, which basically describes capuchin monkeys. <laughs> Terrible pets. <laughs> like what happens with termite fishing, Subadult males pay closer attention to adult males when they are foraging extractively than subadult females do. Subadult females don't pay attention to, sub to adult males. And then the subadult males who pay the closest attention end up acquiring adult levels of proficiency at this skill the fastest. So at least in some species, males and females are acquiring different foraging skills by seeking out different social learning opportunities. The mechanism for, this mechanism for acquiring sex type social behavior has not really been looked at before, but it is being looked at now in the field by Chris Sabai, who's a graduate student at the, uni at the University of New Mexico. She's working on chimpanzee social development in Uganda with Leakey Foundation support. And before I share with you her results, I need to give you some background on chimpanzees. So chimpanzees live in a fission fusion social system in which not everybody is together at the same time. They're kind of like you. You're with me now, but later you're gonna be with some other people. And Males uh, stay in their natal communities, communities where they were born, and they cooperate with other males who also stayed in their natal communities to defend territories against other groups of males. And as a result, they're much, 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 much more gre gregarious than males. They spend a lot of time together. Females hardly spend any time together. They mostly forage alone with their dependent offspring. As a result, these males have very strong social bonds, which they maintain through a lot of grooming whereas females grew much, much less than males. So this is really a male-type behavior. 
Now, it's very important for a male juvenile to integrate well into the adult male club because his eventual reproductive success will depend on how well he does there. So as we would expect to, given them that fact, juvenile males are very motivated to be around adult males. They try really hard to spend time with adult males. They try really hard to interact socially with adult males, and juvenile females really do not. Juveniles generally, though, when they're around other individuals, are interested in stuff that other people do and that other people have. And when I say people, really, I mean chimpanzees. And they exhibit this interest in, in what other individuals are doing uh, by this behavior that you would call really uncomfortably close sh staring. We call it peering. So they get all up in your business and they look really, really closely at what you're doing. So what Chris is doing is she's watching juveniles watch other individuals interact socially, such as during grooming, to see what they do after that. So whether they're modeling their behavior after what they see. And what she's finding so far, and please don't uh, tweet this result because this is, she just sent me this uh, from the field the other day. What she's finding so far is that juvenile males and females watch the same amount, but after watching grooming, juvenile males are far more likely to copy this behavior. Up, upwards of, of 80%, 80 there's an 80% probability that a juvenile male will groom after he watches someone else groom, and only a 20% probability that females will groom after they watch somebody else groom. So what this looks like is the obverse of the termite fishing data. Here, juvenile male chimps are copying others' grooming behavior and females are not, whereas with termite fishing, juvenile females are copying their mom's termite fishing behavior and males are not. So in summary, the data showing that juvenile primates seek out sex differential social interactions are plentiful. We have lots and lots of it for lots of species, and that means that we have in lots of species the necessary precursor for behavioral modeling. The data showing that juvenile primates model their behavior after same-sex demonstrators is so far pretty spare, but I think that they are really compelling. And I think as people continue to look at this in the wild, we will see more and more of these data. So right now, I think this means that intrinsically motivated socialization is likely to be an important factor in primate sex type development. So what are the implications of these data for humans? This is where I go out on a limb and I tell you what I think based on what I know. So the first thing I think is that somatic factors are important in gender development for humans, but it's really complicated and we should be really, really wary of simplistic, connect of simplistic explanations that try to connect things like prenatal hormone exposure on the one hand with things like performance on Wall Street 40 years later, because there are a lot of developmental steps in between those two time points. And we know that that developmental process is very complicated. So, be wary of simplistic explanations about somatic factors and their importance in gender development. The second, I think, is that behavioral diversity should really be an expectation of our complex developmental process, not in any way a surprise. The third is that I think there's no good evidence for overt gender socialization or punishment of gender atypical behavior or any of that stuff in non-human primates. That's just an us thing. So maybe we could stop that. The fourth is that intrinsically motivated socialization of sex type behavior is almost certainly not unique to us. In fact, I think that that might be an evolved mechanism of behavioral development, and I think that that evolved mechanism might have a pretty deep evolutionary, evolutionary history. And if that's the case, here's my big final if-then gender revolutionary statement. If that tendency has deep evolutionary roots, then most kids, maybe not the kids that you all used to be, but most kids, are gonna be inclined to look around them and model their behavior after what they see. So if we actually wanna release people from the confines of binary gender expression, if we want it to really be true when we tell our sons and daughters and our nieces and nephews that they can be anything that they want to be, it won't be enough to just stop overtly socializing them to be one way of being male and one way of being female. If, as a society, we continue to model for them only one way mainly of being a male and one way mainly of being a female, then we'll still end up with a gender binary because most kids will model their behavior up after the, the, the things that they're presented with. So if we really want to allow our kids to be whatever they want to be and to release them from a gender binary, then what we will have to do is show them what that looks like. So look around at the gender nonconformists sitting beside you, pat each other on the back, because if I'm right about evolved ways of acquiring gender behavior, then you may be creating opportunities and options for the kids of today and the adults of tomorrow in one more way than you thought you were. So thank you.